Don't get it twisted. This gun isn't all rainbows and sunshine because it does have a couple of cons that you really should know about before you even try to pick one of these up. Because if I would have known what I know now about these rifles, I would have ordered one in a completely different configuration. Welcome back party people. Hope you guys are doing awesome today. So historically speaking, the two cheapest ways to get into AR-15s was to either A, buy something that's really cheap and affordable, and then upgrade the parts that you feel that need to be upgraded over time. The downside to doing it this way is you have a lot of waste because you might swap out the bolts, you might swap out something else, and then you got all these parts laying around. Not that that's a bad thing, but some people don't like it. So in order to not have a ton of extra parts laying around, a lot of people turn to building one of these from the ground up. And that way they can choose the specific parts that they want for their gun. And sometimes if you do it that way, it comes out a lot cheaper than just getting one off the shelf. However, that just changed because I just discovered this giant killer right here. This is the PSA Sabre Billet Edition. And so far, this is one of the best AR-15s that I've tested that cost less than 10 Benjamin Franklins. Because somehow, PSA was able to pack this full of high-end parts and high-end features and somehow keep the price incredibly low. So if you haven't watched any of my videos before, I've been going through this series of different types of rifles and I've been looking for things I consider to be giant killers. What exactly is a giant killer? Well, in order to understand that, you need to understand what my price ranging is for different classes. I consider anything that costs less than a thousand bucks to be lower end. I consider anything between a thousand and eighteen hundred to be mid-level. And I consider anything over eighteen hundred to be higher end, and at least in regards to pricing. And so a gun can be a giant killer in two different ways. The first way is it can jump from one pricing category to the other one based on the features that the gun has. For example, a BCM Recce 14 is typically in the mid-level price range. But if you could find an affordable gun that had all the same features, then that affordable gun would be considered a giant killer because it jumps from one price category to the next. The second way that a gun can be a giant killer is that they can't be built by the end user for any cheaper than you can pick them up off the shelf. Now, a giant killer only has to meet one of those criteria, but this gun actually meets both of them. Now, in order to understand why this gun might be a giant killer, we need to briefly take a look at some of its competition in regards to pricing. And all of these guns that we're gonna talk about are in the affordable range of the pricing that I'm talking about. First up is the Diamondback DB15. These can be had in a bunch of different configurations and they're relatively affordable in the lower end of the price range. Some of them you can get with a CMC trigger, but most of them come with mil spec. You can also get them with different hand guards. The next one in that pricing category is the Springfield Saint Victor. And these guns are a little bit of a step up for most of your other affordable AR-15s. They do have nicer hand guards, they have nicer muzzle devices, and they have nicer triggers, and they use uh, Bravo Company stocks and grips on some of them. Another popular option that people like to get is the M&P Sport or the Sport 2, whichever one you want to call it. They're great guns, but they're just very basic for the price point. Everything on them is basically mil spec, so if you bought one, you're not going to be able to configure it any way you want, so you're going to have to upgrade the parts if you want to have something a little bit better. Another good competitor is the Ruger AR556. These also have mil spec internals. You can also configure them with different hand guards and furniture. The next one that a lot of people tend to like is the IWI Zion. I haven't personally tested that one yet, but I hope to in the near future. Now these you can configure with like B5 systems, stocks and grips, but everything else on them is completely mil spec. And then the most affordable by far on this list is the Radical Firearms AR-15s. These things can be had for dirt cheap. In in fact, my very first AR-15 was a build I did with Radical Firearms parts, and it still shoots to this day. That reminds me, as we go through this video, not only are we gonna be talking about the PSA Saber, we're gonna be talking about a lot of other stuff as well. And I will create a parts list for everything that you see in this video. And so the best way to find that parts list is the first link in the description. I'll also pin it down in the comments section for you as well. I also have instructions over at the parts list on how not to pay full price for certain things. Now, of the five affordable guns that we just mentioned, there are 15 things that none of them have. With the exception of some of the Diamondback DB15s and the Springfield Victor, none of them have an enhanced trigger. None of them on that list have an enhanced bolt carrier group. None of them have an option for upgraded safeties, um, nor do they have the option to get a 45 degree safety. 
safety. None of them have any type of anti-walk trigger pins in them. Also, none of them include any ambidextrous features at all. So that includes no ambidextrous charging handles, no ambidextrous bolt releases, and no ambidextrous mag releases. Another thing that none of those other brands offer is a CNC'd receiver set. Not that that's the best thing in the world, they just don't offer it. None of them offer any type of upgraded takedown pins. None of them come with an upgraded buffer or buffer spring. None of them offer an adjustable gas block option. And none of them offer anything less than a 16 inch barrel in regards to being a rifle link. So you can't get a 13.9, 13.7, 14.5, pin weld with any of those other options at those current pricing points. Additionally, none of them have any muzzle devices that are included with them that have any type of quick detach system for Surefire, or if you wanted to get a Chemo or a Key Micro, you would have to buy that separately. And lastly, not a single one of those offers a cold hammer forged barrel option. At least in regards to what I could find through my research, I could have missed something. If I'm wrong about that, let me know down in the comments. In fact, I even took the cheapest version that was on that list, being the Radical Firearms, being at about 350, and I went online and I looked up all the parts that I would need to upgrade it to the status of this one, meaning all the parts that are on there. And after I added everything up, you could get really close to upgrading a $350 rifle to be something like this, but you still would be missing a few things. You would be missing the CNC receiver set. You'd also be missing all the ambidextrous features of this, like the ambidextrous bolt release. However, don't get it twisted. This gun isn't all rainbows and sunshine because it does have a couple of cons that you really should know about before you even try to pick one of these up. Because if I would have known what I know now about these rifles, I would have ordered one in a completely different configuration. PSA didn't pay me for this video. They have no idea when this video is coming out. They don't see these videos before you do. They sent me the rifle. That doesn't affect the outcome of the review. If you don't believe me, just go watch my Daniel Defense video right here. They sent me that rifle and I didn't give them a raving review. I say that to say this, my opinions are my own. If you choose to believe me, cool. If you choose not to believe me, that's also cool. Now with that said, if this gun fails in any way throughout this review process, you will know about it. But also don't take my word for it because I only have a sample size of one. Be sure to watch other people's videos. Also go to Reddit and check other people's experiences with these rifles because I could have a really good experience and the rest of the world could have the opposite or vice versa. Also, I was checking out the analytics the other day. It turns out that about 70% of you guys that are watching the videos aren't subscribed to the channel. So if you could do me a favor, hit the subscribe button. If you do, it helps us get trending in the algorithm. And the best part about that is it makes these videos show up in people's feeds who have never been exposed to Second Amendment content before. And that's how I discovered firearms eight, nine years ago. My goal in making these videos is to reach people that were in a similar situation as I was because I didn't have any friends with guns. And so I had to learn everything in the beginning from YouTube. So all you gotta do, hit subscribe to make that happen and help some other people out as well. Now, in regards to the Sabre line of PSA rifles, they come in a ton of different configurations, which we're gonna go into a lot of detail on. However, there is a caveat. None of the things that I'm gonna be talking about are gonna apply to the AR-10 platform from the Sabre line, nor are they gonna apply to the Mark 12 version that came out that everyone's wetting their panties over. Currently, the PSA Sabre comes in two main lines. First one is the Forge line. Second one is the one that we have here today called the Billet line. They have a lot of similarities, but they also have some differences. And because of those similarities and differences, there are trade-offs that you would make to get a billet one, and there are trade-offs that you would make from the billet one to go into the forge line. For example, with the billet line, you get a CNC machined receiver set. You also get an ambidextrous bolt release and an ambidextrous mag release. When you go to the forge line, you don't get any of that, but the forge line has some things that the billet line doesn't. For example, with some of the forge line versions, you can get them included with Geisley triggers, Geisley hand guards and cold hammer forged barrels. And if you get the ones that have the Geisley handguards, the barrel not only is cold hammer forged, but they also do the cross pinning on the gas block. That's just a couple of the differences between all of these guns. Now the gun we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the Blackout Defense, this is probably my favorite gun that it is in the higher end of the price range, but it, right now it's my current all time favorite. If you wanna know more about that, you can go watch the video after this video. Now, although the PSA Sabre doesn't have drop down menus like the Blackout Defense, they do have a ton of different variations of the different rifles that you can get. However, it can be a little bit confusing if you don't know what you're looking for, especially when you start seeing all the options. Because like I said earlier, if I would have known what I know now, I would have ordered a different version of this. Now, before we talk about the differences, 
in a lot of these PSA savers, let's talk about the one thing that they all have in common. They're all made in America, pretty awesome. Number two, they all have an upgraded Spring Co buffer spring. Number three, they all have Battle Arms development upgraded takedown pins. Number four, they all have a Hyperfire Enhanced Mil Spec Plus trigger in it with JP reduced powered springs. Now I know some people might be worried about light primer strikes. We will talk about that as we get to the shooting footage. All of them have anti-walk pins for the trigger. All of them come with a Radian ambidextrous charging handle and all of them come with the Radian 4590 ambidextrous safety selector. That Those things alone are over $290 worth of upgrades. Now, in regards to the furniture um, on the guns, mainly we're talking about the grips and the stocks. They have uh, quite a few different versions that you could choose from. Some of them come with the B5 system stock and grip. Some of them come with Magpul stock and grip. Some of them come with the Sabre branded stocks and grips. And then some of them have the classic, like A1 style stocks. In regards to their barrel links, there's three or four different barrel links. 13.7, I th believe there's a 13.9. There's a 14.5, all of those are pin welded. And then they have a 16 inch. And for barrel types, they have three different types. You can either get them as a 416R stainless steel, you can get them as a 4150 chromoly vanadium, or as I mentioned earlier, you can also get them with a FN cold hammer forged barrel. Also something to be on the lookout for is some of them are one seven twist, and some of them are a one in eight twist rate. In regards to the chambering, some of them are chambered in 556 NATO and others are chambered in 223 Wild. In regards to the gas length, I believe they're all using a mid-length gas system. Some of them include adjustable gas blocks. Some of them include non-adjustable gas blocks. And then some of them include the non-adjustable Geisley gas blocks. Those are the ones that are gonna be cross pinned on the barrel and those come with the cold hammer forge barrels and the Geisley handguards. In regards to the buffers, some of them are gonna have a carbine buffer. Some of them are gonna have an H2 style buffer. And then some of them are gonna have what this gun has, which is a TACOM three-stage buffer system. Let me show you what it looks like real quick. It's kind of crazy. Something else I should mention is, at least in the billet version, I don't know if this applies to the forged line or not, but underneath your grip back here, there is a set screw that you can use that will reduce any wobble between the upper and the lower. So this is the TACOM three-stage buffer right here that I was talking about earlier. This is, if you bought these separately, which you can, I'll have links at the parts list for them. Um, they're about 50 bucks, $55 or something like that. It's a very weird and interesting buffer and it's incredibly lightweight. In fact, it only weighs 2.2 ounces. You know, as an example, I have a T1 BCM buffer right here. That one weighs 4.9 ounces. And so you might be wondering, well, isn't this thing over gassed because it should be, right? Well, not exactly, and that'll make more sense here in a little while when we start talking about the bolt carrier group, but that's the system it comes with. As I mentioned earlier, all of them come with a Spring Co buffer spring, but this one in particular, the on the billet line, came with the TACCOM three-stage buffer system, and you'll see how well it shoots when we get to the shooting footage. Now, when I first got this gun, the TACCOM buffer system kind of threw me off because you see I got a ma an empty magazine in here right now. When I pull the charging handle, if I didn't pull it hard enough, it wouldn't lock open. Because of that little spring in there, uh, it made it a little different, but you just pull it a little bit harder and it does break in over time. But we'll talk more about that when we get to the shooting footage and what it feels like. All of the Sabre AR-15s are gonna come with one of two different bolt carrier groups. The first bolt carrier group they're gonna come with is the Fathers of Freedom bolt carrier group that's made by a company called Microbest. And Microbest actually makes decent bolt carrier groups. They have spring coat gas rings, they're made of Carpenter 158 steel, and those bolt carrier groups can be bought separately. A lot of people love them, but they're also sold out a lot, but I'll make sure to have a link over at the parts list for you. And then the second type of bolt carrier group, which was included with this one that I think probably matches the TACOM buffer system a lot better, is the Sabre Lightweight Bolt Carrier Group. And these bolt carrier groups can be bought separately as well. They have three different finishes. Uh, the one that's included is a DLC, diamond light coating. They also have titanium nitride. And then they have something called chromium nitride, which I've never tested or heard of before. It looks like nickel boron, but it's something different. They are using a hardened gas key under the USGI specifications. They also have grade eight screws and it's staked per mil spec and the carrier is made of 8620 steel. So this is the lightweight bolt carrier group that I'm talking about. You're gonna notice a couple of interesting things about this. Number one, it's not a full auto rated bolt carrier group, mainly just a carrier. I mean, the bolt is fine, but they cut all that weight 
because as I showed you earlier with the buffer system, this thing only weighs 2.2 ounces and to get it gas just perfectly, they had to do a lightweight bolt carrier group. In fact, this bolt carrier weighs 9.8 ounces. And if we compare that to a standard mil spec bolt carrier group that weighs 12.3 ounces. Now, as I mentioned, this bolt carrier group isn't bad. It's been functioning really well. It's a diamond light -like coating that's on here. You can see where it says it's Carpenter 158 steel, magnetic particle inspected. And another thing that I tested in this gun is in some older PSA guns, some people had noted that some of the lugs on the bolt wouldn't be aligned properly with the lugs in the barrel. And to kind of show you what I mean, I'm gonna shine a light down into here. Some people were noting that their lugs in their chambering would have gashes on them from where the lugs on the bolt carrier group didn't perfectly mate with it. And as you can see on here, there's zero gashes. And so that means the bolt, the upper receiver and the barrel are true to one another and they are aligned perfectly. Now, one thing you will notice about this lightweight version that might make or break which one you get is you'll notice that the carrier isn't full auto cap capable. Not that that's a big deal because none of us are shooting full auto, but a lot of people just, they don't want a bolt carrier group if it's semi-auto only. Unless you get the licensing one day to do full auto, it's not gonna matter. Now with the muzzle devices, this is where it gets really interesting with these. As I mentioned earlier, there is a ton of different muzzle devices that you can choose from. First off, you can get the JMAC Chemo or Key Micro QD style. And within those, they have different types. Some of them are comps, some of them are flash hiders. They also have some that have Surefire muzzle devices. So if you use a QD system where you could use something like this, this is the Surefire Warden. This is a blast redirection device. It's not a silencer. Um, but you could use the silencers or the Surefire Warden. Like I said, I'll have links over at the parts list for this stuff. So they have that. Then they also have some PSA Sabre branded compensators. They also have Silencer Co. and their QD for Silencer Co. They also have Advanced Armament, and then they have some from Huxworks. Tons of different options. But if you are gonna get a pin weld version, that's something you really wanna pay attention to because taking off a pin welded muzzle device, although it is totally possible, if it's done incorrectly, can ruin the threads of your barrel, then you gotta buy a new barrel. So might as well do it right the first time. Now let's talk about hand guards. And this is one of the areas that I have a bone to pick with this one. And this is one of the reasons why if I would have known what I known today, I would have ordered a different one. So they have five different hand guards that are available for this. They have something called the Sabre QD rail. They also have one called the Sabre Lockup Rail, which is the one that I have. They have the Sabre Knurled Slant Rail. Then they have a quad rail for those of you guys that like quad rails. And then, like I mentioned earlier, they also have Geisley handguards with some of their forge lines. And the Geisley handguards also come with the reinforced QD spots on here. And so if you're gonna put a sling on there, you don't wanna put a sling through bare aluminum because it'll rip out. So let's talk about this handguard and why I hate it. So when I first got this gun, this one came with the lockup rail. Every time I get a gun, I try to take things apart just to see how they worked. And I noticed that this one only had these two tiny set screws on the bottom. And I was like, that can't be the only thing that's holding this gun, this handguard onto here. Because I wanted to see what types of anti-rotation supports that it had, and also what prevented this from sliding off the end of the rail. And it took me quite a bit of research, but I found a video that Palmetto State Armory actually released. And this rail is unnecessarily complicated. Essentially, the way this works, is these two set screws are simply just that, set screws. This rail essentially threads onto the barrel nut that they have on here. And it requires a proprietary special tool to not only put it on, but also to remove it. And in the box, there is no tool included. So I called up Palmetto State Armory and I asked them, hey, can I get one of those tools? because I might want to take it off and stuff. And they said if the majority of people took this rail off that they wouldn't be able to get it back on. And that bothers me because it's not user serviceable. Because I was wondering why you couldn't get this rail with the cold hammer forge barrel and with the cross pinned gas block on it. And it turns out that this rail has to be installed before the gas block can be installed. And I didn't like that because I was like, wait a second, so because this is pin welded, you have to remove the gas block before you can remove the rail 
well, how the heck does that work? Because you can't get the gas block off because you can't get the muzzle device off. I'm gonna figure out how to get this off because I wanna change it just because it bothers me that these are not user serviceable. Now, another thing to mention with the hand guards, I did mention that the Geisley came with the reinforced QD spots, but there's another rail that also comes with it. And we'll get to that when I start talking about how I would configure this knowing what I know now. But I wanted to show you this lockup rail if you see any version of the PSA Sabre with that rail, I would just avoid it. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you would have problems, but if your gas tube blows up or if something malfunctions with your gas block, especially if you get a pin welded version, you're kind of SOL because according to Palmetto State Armory, if a standard person takes this handguard off, they're not gonna be able to get it back on and they don't have a tool available for you. This rail, to in my humble opinion, is a big fail. So now that I've fried your brain with a ton of different details about the Sabre, let's talk about the most important thing. How the heck does this thing even shoot? So as of right now, I'm around 400 round mark on this rifle. I've tested it with a few different mags. I've tested it with the PSA Sabre magazine that comes with it. It worked just fine. Locked open every single time on the last round. I also tested it with PMAGs, worked just fine. And I tested it with my Lancer magazines and it worked just fine as well. Had zero malfunctions with it. Every single time it locked open and I didn't get any double feeds or anything like that. So that's always good. I don't expect it to malfunction. Not only did it just perform without any malfunctions, but this thing is incredible in the way that it feels. And what I mean by that, if you have never experienced a gun that is a 13.9 up to like a 14.5 pin weld, that shoots really fast and flat, it will change your life. This gun feels in the hand in regards to the recoil impulse, just like my BCM Recce 14 and very similar to the uh, Blackout Defense rifle that I shot, just in regards to the recoil impulse. I'm not talking about everything because the Blackout has an amazing trigger in it. Now, despite being just an enhanced mil-spec trigger, this trigger is really good, the hyperfire. You can shoot this trigger incredibly fast, has a really good positive reset that you can feel. It kind of pushes your finger out a little bit. And also it pulls at a very crisp, clean three and a half pounds. Not bad for just a mil spec enhanced trigger. Now, I don't remember the weight of this gun, but it comes in at around seven pounds, but with this Holosun Ames and with this angled foregrip, it comes in at seven pounds, four ounces. But the thing to know about guns that are that are the 13, 7, 13, 9, and 14 fives is the balance of them. So a lot of the weight is just back here. When you wanna go press out or you wanna come up from here to here, or you come in here and here, it is super quick because the, all the weight is distributed back here instead of hanging out out here on the end of the muzzle. Even when I have this guy on there, it's still very good weight distribution. In fact, when you put like a light on here and you put one of these on here and you put one of these on here, it gives you a perfect balance across the board. That makes this gun shoot incredibly fast and incredibly flat. Now, in regards to the gassing of this gun, it seemed to be perfectly gassed from the factory. Based on the ejection pattern, it was coming out 100% of the time. I tested this with a couple different types of ammo. I had some Fioki, 55 grain. I also tested it with some PMC bronze, 55 grain. And there is a little bit of a downside to that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love that this thing is perfectly gassed, but if you were to suppress it, it would increase the gas. And the downside is on this specific model that I have, there's no adjustable gas block. And as you saw earlier, we had the lightweight bolt carrier group and then we had that lightweight TACOM buffer system. I don't know if this would be the right suppressor host just because you've got a lot of lightweight things happening in there. So you would probably have to get like a heavier buffer or you'd have to get a full size bolt carrier group. Honestly, don't know. I haven't had a chance to get a suppressor to figure that out with this gun. So that's just something to be noted. Another caveat to the testing that I was able to do and not able to do is I got this gun in the summertime and I have not been able to go outdoors to go shooting as of yet. It is starting to finally cool off a little bit. I'm just waiting for them to lift the fire restrictions. I say that because I was stuck at an indoor range, I wasn't able to do any types of accuracy test with this. And so I can't tell you what kind of groups you would get with this. And so hopefully in the near future, I have to do some tests with the Blackout Defense in the near future because I wasn't able to do that either. So I'm gonna take this gun out as well and see what we can get. However, it's not without its cons and its pros in regards to these controls because I'll be honest with you, I don't know how I feel about the AMBI system. So let's go over to pros first and we'll go over to cons. Pro number one is the price to value ratio for what you get for the money. The biggest pro is most of their guns on the PSA Sabre line, and when I say most, I mean most of the AR-15s are under the $1,000 mark. 
Now, if you get the one with the cold hammer forged barrels, with the Geisley gas block that's cross pinned and with the Geisley hand guards, they can go up to 11 or 1200. But if you can still get cold hammer forged without that hand guard, if you so chose, those are the top of the line on the forge line. But even so, you get all of that for like the highest price I think I saw was about 1200 and you get all the QDs and all that stuff. I just don't know of another manufacturer that's making guns with this many parts and features available in it for that price point. Another pro is at least on the billet line, it does have a forward assist. A lot of billet receivers don't have forward assist. The next pro is how many different versions of these guns are available and how many different configurations you can get. I, I love that there's choices. Makes me very happy to see that. The final pro is they have lifetime warranties because they're made in America. Now let's get onto the cons. So aside from the handguard that I talked about earlier that you should avoid, I guess my biggest con about this Sabre lineup is the trade-offs you have to make to go with a forged or a billet receiver set. And what I mean by that is you can't buy this billet receiver by itself. You have to buy a receiver set that has like an upper and a lower. It is the cheapest, most affordable receiver set that you'll ever find, but you'd have to build a full gun. But with the forge line, you can buy a complete lower. So I wish they would offer the billet in a complete lower because that way, if you wanted ambidextrous, you could go that route. And so it's kind of a bummer that you have to get the full gun or just a receiver set to get ambidextrous controls. My next con is you can't get cold hammer forged barrels or the Geisley handguards with the billet line. I don't know why. I do know that Geisley states on their website that their handguards are not compatible with billet uppers. So that I, I can kind of understand that but I don't understand why you can't get FN cold hammer forge barrels on this lineup. The next con is the ambidextrous bolt release. When I reviewed the Blackout Defense rifle a couple weeks ago, it has an ambidextrous bolt release as well. And it felt like it was in a very natural position in regards to doing a, you know, a mag reload and then using your index finger to send the bolt home. This one feels out of place and I don't know how to explain it, but basically, when my finger is here, I have to reach way up here to do it. And there's also a break-in period with it. Keep that in mind. It is kind of hard to depress your first few mag changes, but it does break in over time. But my biggest problem was when this door is open, my finger wants to hit the door a lot and not the button itself. Or there was a time where I accidentally hit the mag release. It's just getting used to it. but. When I compared it to the Blackout Defense, which I get it, the Blackout Defense is more than twice the price. It was just, there was no thinking about it. It was just more natural and intuitive. And so that's a small price to pay to get a ton of features at a cheap price, I would say. I say all that to say this. If I was gonna order the billet version again, I would get it with just the Saber QD rail instead of this lockup rail for the reasons that I talked about earlier. I'm still gonna change this handguard. I just gotta figure out how to get it off. If I was gonna go for the forged lineup, I would 100% just go with the FN cold hammer forged barrel with the Geisley gas block and the Geisley rail. You can buy those uppers completely separate. And so if you wanted to not have the Sabre lower receiver, you don't have to. I mean, but I think if you bought the full gun, it's like 1200 bucks or so. Now I know that's not under a thousand dollars, but it is the best bang for the buck in regards to the configurations. So I say all that to say this, I'm not telling you to go out and get one of these. I really don't care if you do or don't. I would buy one knowing what I know now, but I would just buy it differently. Although this gun does not have all the technology that my Blackout Defense has, and although it's not on the same level, this is like the cheap step cousin of this gun. It has approximately 97% of the feel of that gun, with the exception of the trigger and the exception of the ambi mag release, it just doesn't feel the same. This gun isn't for everybody, but if you are wanting to get the most bang for your buck for a thousand bucks and less, it's a tough gun to beat. Yeah, there's flaws with it, but everything has flaws. So let me know your thoughts, guys, down in the comment section. Until next time, I love you, and you guys stay sexy.